Hello everyone, we are so glad you have stopped by our YouTube channel. Through the years, we have gathered many wonderful sermons, and we decided we should share them with you. If you enjoy, we ask you would like, comment, and subscribe. Please leave a comment telling us what your favorite part of the sermon is. Also, since some of the recordings are from cassette tape, we do not have all the information. If you have information on the recording, please leave it in the comment. Thank you, and may God bless you. They just wouldn't dare do otherwise. <laughs> All right. That's faith. <laughs> You've got a lot of faith. Uh, it's very difficult for such a broad uh, outlay of uh, what is necessary to know about some of the things involved in human uh, dealing. It's no use for me to try to uh, build up any kind of a something here that would be artificial. We have, uh, that's one of our, our main thinking in a way. We have a lot of groanings on the field. We have hear it. And in fact, it's uh, not been very good <clears throat> in behalf of uh, the young ministers going around, it, they will they will talk to me, and they have their complaints. But on the other hand, uh, you're not too responsible for it. That is, uh, until they catch hold to you. That is, if you feel like that's what you want to do, uh, have an artificial ministry. Now, there's a lot of it that's going on. A lot of people can preach without being anointed. They can preach without praying. <clears throat> they can preach by just coming in to the, uh, to the church from a, a dove or a quail hunt or a deer hunt and, and preach just as if there's, you think they were anointed. And, of course, there's a great misconception about what's anointing and what's not anointing. Uh, that we've got such a feel of preachers today. To, the emphasis is on excitement and getting the folks to respond and get a lot of amens to such an extent that we get artificial preaching. That is, it's not the genuine, it's uh, what you want. You know what they want to hear, you give them what they want to hear. And a lot of people don't need to hear what they want to hear, they need to hear something they don't want to hear. Amen. And uh, then it's a sad thing to go through life never having known what is genuine inspiration. Now, you can be inspired to do nearly anything. That is, uh, great athletes get inspired. They, that's the reason why their visions are like they are. They have a vision to exceed, and they hear the crowd are howling and screaming, and, and here they go, whether it's a running a race or carrying a ball in their hands or, or anything that would give them attention. And there is another thing. You see, every time you go to talking about it, it brings you another thing. Attention. Attention. That's why ladies dress like they do. They want attention. And attention is what they get sometimes when they cry. They'll pout for attention. And uh, they'll have artificial pain. It's been proven that people suffer. And, and not sick. They are not sick, but they suffer. They have created this pain mentally. Then you can create things yourself. Now, in the uh, first chapter of Timothy, fifth verse, first chapter of Second Timothy, when I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois, in thy mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that it in thee also. I would also read uh, first Timothy, the first chapter, the fourth chapter. And the twelfth verse. First Timothy four and twelve. Let no man despise thy youth, but be thou an example of the believers in word, in conversation, 
in charity, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. May the Lord bless you. If I, if I get to it, I'll uh, have Brother Holly read me a, a scripture or two. You may be seated. The Lord bless you. Uh, a young mind can get impressed. Now, when you mean by impressed, uh, I was making a, my wife mixed up some waffle mix and somebody gave us a waffle line for Christmas and I had never baked one in that thing. And uh, that is, I can, rem I can remember many years ago I did. But. And then when I got through with it, it was all right just what I wanted but the thing was impressed it was impressed with a, a mold it didn't come out of there flat it came out with impressions if I made a pancake it wouldn't have no impressions it would have just been poured out there when it come out just as it rolled out and there's a difference in a pancake and a waffle a pancake has no impressions that is no, nothing has impressed influence on it When my wife took uh, what I didn't eat out of that same pancake, she put it back in the iron. She had to find where it fit. And so she did. She found the spot and location, stuck it back in there, and reheated the thing. Now, that's don't make a difference for her. But I was watching that, and I thought about uh, the impression that a grandmother left on her daughter daughter left on her son and uh, uh, and the the line in which Apostle Paul liked about it I like that he liked that kind of an impression uh, sometimes some things come about through an accident that'll make a preacher or make a great man now let me give you this one story when Randolph Churchill was uh, was rich and he had his great manor out there, uh, out of London someplace, and his young boy, uh, Winston, was uh, more or less a sort of a prince. They were very, very wealthy. And, and they had a stable man, a man that his job was to clean out stables. And... He uh, had a son, and of course, this man's name was Fleming. And uh, one day, they he looked out there, and the boy looked out there, and Winston had somehow or another had an accident in the pool and was drowning. And the young man stepped outside right away, and immediately he reflected on what he's supposed to do. And he, he jumped in with the, what mind he had thinking about him right quick. It had to be quick, right. And he brought the boy out and, and, uh, and pumped air back into him, and, and uh, he lived. Well, then Mr. Fleming came along, and hunted up the young man and, uh, I mean, Mr. Churchill, and he said, uh, I, I want to do something great for you folks. Uh, you've saved my boy. I, I've got to do something. And Mr. Fleming said, no, no, no. He did what he was supposed to do. He wasn't supposed to do anything else but that one thing, and he, if he did what he was supposed to do, that's what anybody is supposed to do, so there's no reward for that. Well, he's, he's nothing but a stable boy. Now, so be it. Uh, what would you do if you saw my son down there? He did what we were supposed to do. Well, Mr. Randolph Churchill decided that uh, if the old man wouldn't accept anything and he couldn't set him up in a nice, beautiful house and give him a trust fund, why, he set up a trust fund for his boy, the young man in his teens, that saved his son for him to have an education. Now that he says he can't refuse and you must let him have it. Of course, 
the old man could do nothing about it. So when uh, young Fleming became of age, he, uh, he took the scholarship and the trust fund and all the money came in for it while he got an education. And he went in the medical field. And he practiced exactly what he had practiced that day at the pool. And the day came when he became an outstanding research man. And one day, why uh, Winston Churchill was sick again, awfully, awful sick. And he was a, a married man and in politics and uh, been an admiral and all of that and, and uh, was high in the office of the world. And somebody told him that there, there was a young man in northern Scotland that had uh, invented a new medicine and that it would be a good thing to try it. So anything to save his life, they rushed over there and got it and brought it back. And uh, they brought the doctor with them and, and uh, he gave them a shot and uh, he recovered. And he looked in the face of that doctor and he said, uh, Arthur Fleming, you have saved my life twice. But the first time he saved it, he saved it as a stable boy. The second time he saved it as a research man in medicine. He was the inventor of the medicine called penicillin. And I happen to have seen his, is the place where he invented it. And you can see pretty well that though you may be in a way a stable boy, catch on to what you can for everything you can meticulously you can and become what you're supposed to be. Now if you're going to be an artificial preacher, there's a lot of them out there. And if you want to add to the number, help yourself. They are succeeding. Yes sir, they are succeeding in making money. And if it's driving a big car you've got your mind on, why uh, forget about prayer meeting. Just make your grades. If you can, have your mind on that. You get your mind on it. That's your goal. But then, of course, that's not the idea that Apostle Paul was talking about here. The impression that we must get in our mind is how can we turn this world around? Or how can we turn our part of the world around? And now, some of the most lost people are not nuts. They pretty well look at you and they pretty well size you up. By the time you say three words, they can pretty well figure you out. Now, there isn't any wrong in you having uh, what you might want to have uh, a response of genuine appreciation from people. But if your goal is for yourself and not for a soul, you, if you want a soul, you want him because he, because he uh, means something to me in my pocketbook. It's not a soul you're after. You're after what that soul's got. Apostle Paul said, I'm not after you, yours, but you. And I would, uh, I would think about how Apostle Paul worded that so very well. He said, I... You, you never can raise up and say that I'm responsible, that you're responsible for me. Before I'd ever let you put that on me, I work with my own hands. But he didn't forget what he was after all the way through. It was to turn the hearts of men around. Now, you've got to make an impression. They say the first impression is a lasting impression. If it is a lasting impression, then somebody today has got their marks on you. Somebody, somewhere, you've heard them and you saw them. They put a brand on you. And you've got that impression right now. Whether you are going to live throughout your life that way, well, it makes, it's all up to you. You could throw that impression off and take the right impression. Uh, maybe you don't have Calvary's meaning all the way through. Uh, millions and millions of people have forgot about what it means to be a Christian. But they call themselves Christian. 
They drink and they cuss, but they call it children. They're Christians. But that's not what we want to be. And of course, now we get into the, uh, to the uh, close part of pastoring or evangelist. Now this we must remember. That a human being is a peculiar little tricky thing. It's full of emotions, sensitivities. It's uh, ready to be bounced around either way. It loves to gossip. It has a long tongue. It loves to relate stories and not exactly like they've been told. Would like to add a little bit something to it. They cause trouble for themselves. Some of them are troublemakers. Some of them are born enemies to a preacher. Some of them will just waylay you and wait and bide that time, and they'll finally pull the rug out from under you. And that's the human nature of things. There's a human nature of uh, some women never leave preachers alone. A preacher to them is a star. No matter if he's not too good looking in the face, It'd be a wonderful thing if we was all pure ugly like me. And, uh, but that's not the fact. But you will watch yourself. You will start appealing to that kind of folks. Because I am convinced that spirit acquaints himself with spirit. You can be married and maybe have a child or two. Your troubles are not over. That's no sign that anybody will leave you alone. Because if your mind is that way and you meet up a woman with that in her mind, you both recognize it right away. It becomes a, 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 it's a, it's a magnet that draws. And if you don't know how to throw that off and kill that in you first, you're going to have problems along the way in that line. That's why he said in behavior, I'd like for you to behave in such a way uh, that you wouldn't have to, nobody wouldn't be sorry that you made a, well, you just made a fool out of yourself. You didn't say the right words. An example to the believers, in word, don't ever tell a lie. Tell the truth. If they ever catch you in a lie, they'll never stop reminding you of it. Word. Now, that could be the Bible, but that could be your word, too. You have to keep your word with mankind. And another thing I might mention as I go along here. A lot of people are in trouble, family trouble, uh, personal trouble. They oftentimes need to confide in somebody as a counselor. If they see you as a little somebody that blabs everything you tell to everybody, they'll never confide in you. But if they see you as a sober-minded, down-to-earth, genuine person who will sympathize and feel like you will take an interest in their welfare, instead of using it as a model, next week you see, oh, man, I had a case yesterday that beats anything you ever saw. I tell you one thing. That man is in love with his own daughter. Oh, you don't say it. Who is it? Well, I, I better not tell you, but uh, uh, it's the first thing you know. Well, it's that tall fellow, and uh, his wife's a little short, blanketed woman, and you just well tell their name. Because blabbing is not going to help you at all. You've got to be able to hear anything anybody tells you. Now, right here, I could tell you, young men, most of you are young, some things that's been told me. And some things I've heard that's been told to other preachers. That would be a shock to you. 
You might say be indecent language and talk about it. But you're going to be out there in that field where that's going to be spoken. You're going to meet it face forward. It's going to blow you like a cold, chilly wind. You think everybody's a wonderful, genuine Christian because they run the aisle and they speak in tongues. Well, get that out of your head right now. Everybody that runs the aisle and speaks in tongues or even sits down and cries is not, not saved. Maybe they never move from their seat and they look like tender little somebody and they can cry at any little old chicken story you'll tell. Well, you just wait a while. Because you're dealing with the human element. The human element. That is, uh, you're not dealing with a dog or cattle, you deal with a human. You're after a human soul, a human mind, loaded with everything that's worldly. Everything is sinful. They're in the pool hall. They're in the bowling alleys. They're everywhere doing what they want to free charge. And you're inviting them to leave all that and die to it and come to God and forget it. You better know what you're doing. Better know what you've got. You have to have a personal testimony, a great personal testimony to convince you that you are right with God. You can't always tell people your own story because they're tired hearing about you. In conversation, and uh, it's been proven that women talk just as nasty as men. If you spend your time in filthy conversation, that brand is going to be set on you, that impression. And yet the rest of your life, you're going to be a storyteller, a man that likes a big laugh, a man that likes the, uh, the frivolous part of life, and you have no impression on people. Then when folks will be sitting there watching you, can I tell him my problem? Can that girl tell you that she's pregnant and she's not married? What will you do with that kind of a story? Can that boy come and tell you? I'm in trouble with myself. I have personal problems. I don't know what to do with myself. And then you, you listen to it. And how can you help that man? The first impression you get should be from a man that, that knows how to give you advice to impress the mind. That's a solid preacher. There are a lot of shipwreck ministers. A lot of people get uh, discouraged the first year or two on the field. It takes eight or ten years to develop a man out there in that raw field as to a, a preacher. But there's a shortcut, and some folks have taken it, and that's the cut of artificial preaching. And uh, now let me uh, make just one illustration. <clears throat> we watch... As we've been through the rope ourselves and, and still ignorant about a lot of things, but heard a lot of stories in this life about the various elements of things and what's God and what's not God. Because that question will come now, is that of God or is it not of God? People say, God told me. Well, I'm sorry, but I doubt it. I know a church came over one time and 28 preachers wrote me a letter and called me on the phone and told me that God had laid that church on their heart while well, about 27 had to be lying. Amen. But a little church over there just begging for a preacher for two years, God never talked to, them to, to anybody about the full church. Just let that little church go on to perdition. Uh, but he will call you for this big one because it's got a lot of money in it. And I'll be among the big shots of preachers. I'll be able to walk in with a new suit every time I go to church. I can dress up every two hours. Yeah. I'll be there. Now, is that what you want? Is that what you want? That impression on you. And uh, we uh, are watching from the balcony at our Anaheim and listening, joining in, enjoying it. A 
Now they brought a, a young lady up to the podium and asked her to sing. And to me, she sang a beautiful song. And it did me a lot of good. And I don't believe that it was artificial. I believe I could read the reality of it all. And I said to myself, now that's wonderful. I am quite sure the crowd will really react to that. And I think she got three or four amens out of that 10,000 crowd. The poor thing just backed up and went off. And I said, well, Lord, you didn't like that, did you? No power. What's the matter? She didn't sing. You didn't bring fire and water and steam and explosion should have happened at the end of that song. But Lord, you must have not liked it. Because uh, you didn't bless the people. Nobody ran up and down. And nobody hooped and yelled. That's all people wanted. That's what they wanted. But they didn't get it in that song. But yet that song made an impression of Calvary on my mind and the bleeding Christ and his suffering soul and the, the, the method of, of living a deprived life. Take up the cross and follow me, denying yourself. And all that came to me. Uh, I have no place to lay my head. And, oh, it, it's just, it was a great song. Well, the next song brought a trio up there. But God liked that. Man, by the time they sang about three verses, the whole thing was in a bedlam. Well, I said, God, you sure do like that. And, and somebody called that the power of God. Now, these people played upon what people wanted. And you can lead people God knows where on what they want all the time. But a Bible teacher and a preacher is to sincerely know just exactly what am I going to give people. What they want to hear or what they need to hear. What they need to hear. And uh, it's not a matter of saying, well, I'm going to knock their heads off today. That's not the thing. Man, I'm going to skin me some goats today because the sheep are all gone. That's not the way to do it. No. If, you, if you think that your preaching is skinning, it's silly. It's carnal and cheap to express it that way. Preaching is unfolding to men the need of the hour. And the moment they live, they live seven days out there in that world. And you've got to bring them messages fresh, cool, and genuine. You can't play with preaching. You can't play with preaching. Every minute that you live, you should not only earn, but you should, you should earn the honor and respect of every man, woman, and child in that whole congregation. You're not going to buy it. But if you're going to give them uh, a people that say, uh, uh, Brother Gidro, that young preacher that wants this church over there. I, you know, I've had a handle things a long time. Uh, does his wife uh, play the accordion? Does uh, she play the piano? How many children do they have? What kind of children are they? Well, uh, what about this fellow? Is he a sort of a money lover or... Well, you know, they, they can ask you some very embarrassing questions sometimes because people are getting aware they qualify people closer and closer and closer. Then we say that every man ought to just go and marry himself a woman. And before he proposes to her, he's got to be asked, now listen, I'll marry you if you could play the accordion. If you could play the piano, you, you'd be just what I want. I know that uh, I'm in love with you and I... I really do love you, but uh, I'm sorry. I got to look for me a, a piano player. And you may get yourself a chicken hawk, too. Amen. Amen. Because that's not the answer to everything. The Bible didn't say anything about playing the piano in this thing. 
Didn't say a thing about playing the accordion. Didn't say a thing about a big corsage. Didn't say a thing about a good-looking woman. The Word of God. Now, I might tell you this. If you aim to be a soul reacher, go out there and impress people about their God. You don't need any other instrument. You're going to set that, that church on fire in your reality of preaching. I know that you're not going to believe what I'm saying. I know that you're going to see what's going on. And you know what the modern crowd wants. But we're living in a counterculture age. The whole world is turning into a different kind of a culture. It's very simple to talk about children born out of wedlock. What is wedlock? The marriage license is soon going to be thrown out of the window. And you have uh, shacking up, and uh, you've got the, the beetle time, and you have the, uh, the moment of, uh, it, it's even crept into our clothes. Now, I picked this suit of clothes up in Little Rock. I got it cheap. And the reason why that stitch is up there, because there were some hippies one day that liked blue jeans, and they got that blue jean stitch. So I am part of that culture. You see how it plans on to you? Your hair, the styling of your hair is a part of that culture. And it's a turning us, whether we want to or not, it's a changing us. The world don't care very much. The floppy way of life, the leisure way of life, the leisure suit was born out of that, which I'm not against it. Don't have one, wish I had sometimes. But on the hand, where was it born? It was born in the floppy attitude of the American male. And it's leisure. So it is. It's leisure. We are at ease. Now, like uh, we had a young doctor in the Baytown area that we all knew. And when he came back, why, several of us got to talk to him and we always call him Double T, W T. And uh, he came back from that university and we got to talk to him. Uh, he said, You know, there's one thing they did not teach me in university how much to charge, how to collect, and uh, what to do with my money. They didn't say a thing about money. The thing about a doctor's charges. That was the last thing they ever thought about. Why well, a joke when you talked about it to them. And so one old doctor came, was talking to him one day, he said, Look, some of you are bugging us about the charges and the expense and all that stuff. Try to be a good doctor. The best kind of a doctor. The money will take care of itself. You'll never have to worry if you get to be a good doctor. Now, if you want to be a good preacher, uh, have a burden for people and for their welfare. Give them their money's worth, more than money's worth. Go out of your way. Praise God. You know, a strange thing sometimes, the smallest impressions make the, the, the deepest, goes the fathers. Not to mimic anybody, but uh, but to have it original. I remember a fella came to my house and I started to wash my car. He said, "Let me wash that car." I said, "What's the matter with me?" And he said, "Brother Giddles, you just don't need to wash that car. So I'm much younger than you are." Says, so "Let me have that rag." I said, "You better put on some other clothes." Oh, he said, "I've got some more." He says, uh, let me wash that car. And then another time he came by, I was pushed the lawnmower. It was one of them real types. You had to push it. And he said, let me have that lawnmower. And when I got through, brother, he had that whole thing trimmed and fixed up. And uh, do you know that he changed his impression on me right away? What he said in the pulpit began to change immediately. And I began to say that. That young man is sincere. 
And, and one day I was carrying my briefcase and he said, let me have that briefcase. I think I said, it's real with him. It's not something he's going to put on. It's real. And he picked it up and so later on I told him after the years going by, I said, you have no idea how tired I was that day. And that for somebody to stop by and say, I'll pick up Brother Kid Rose's briefcase and put it in the car. It made a great impression on me because nobody else thought about it, but you did. And I want to tell you, I still remember it. He said, I don't. I forgot it. It's just my nature. And you can, you can put a, a nature feeling in your mind that you're not just down there to eat fried chicken, sleep till 11 o'clock in the morning. And then get around and loaf around the barbershop. Uh, you are a preacher. You are a preacher. An impression. The impression that people leave on another can make a great difference in their future. Push me down, dear God. Push me down. To where I can become a person with a good image and a preaching, not only the preaching ability. You know, in this college, you learn so many things to learn. And I can recall when we first moved in here and uh, the way that we had to feed them. And uh, the dining room was a poor, pitiful excuse for a dining room. And uh, the chapel was a little bitty old, something old that way you're eating now. It a, it's, wasn't big enough for all anything. And we, we just looked at this from that, then find the chapels right there. And you could see this empty space of ground. And I began to think in my own mind, uh, why are these children having to stand up? And uh, why can't we have a chapel? And before we you know it, that thought materialized into a dedication of this building. It, it's all together the thinking about something. Maybe I never thought about that. Did you ever hear it said, I never thought about that. Well, that's the truth because some folks have no, no new ideas. Then that there's a comparative thing. You say, uh, oh, I'll tell you, brother so-and-so was here and when we took it, there was only 46 in Sunday school. Here we're running 200. Uh, why don't you just forget about that? Because it's the easiest thing in the world to justify yourself and to brag about yourself. And you want to brag about yourself. And the Bible's against that. But projecting a, oh, on a great achievement in your own mind, well, some of these days you find out what happened to one preacher can happen to you. And it's just as well for us to tell it to you right now. The human family, when it gets together against you, you've got a battle on your hand. When they get together for you, you can coast along for long ways. But you can certainly do something to antagonize them. I heard Brother Pew tell me when he was pastor of the church where all some of my kinfolks are there in First Church in Port Arthur. And... Uh, we were working at the campground and we were discussing various things and he said, you know, Brother Get Rose, I could have those people battling each other in just a few minutes. I know exactly who to touch. There's about three particular people in that church that's connected to the, uh, oh, I guess 60% of the church. And I could change the piano player, I could change the song leader, and I could change the Sunday school superintendent and I've got a war in my hand. But well, why have a war? Why not pray around the war? Why not handle it a different way than have a war? Can you do that? You certainly can. You don't have to confront people to agitate them. You say, well, that's a, that's a one-man show in that church. All right, that's agree. It is a one-man show. But are you going to take a thing like that and say, well, I'm whipped before I walk in? Hold it just a minute. Why don't you bid your time? Why don't you wait and make, and make friends? Make the man believe he is a one-man show. 
until you get an influence as a pastor should. And after you have an influence as a pastor should, it will eventually blend. It will eventually blend. After a while, easily this man is, well, he's there, but he's not there. His image is not there anymore. But if you walk in there and just pull that Sunday school book out of his hand and tell him that he's not this and not that, and do it right away, uh, you'll be out pretty soon. It won't be long. You'll be gone. Oh, how easy you've got to work with a human family. It's a tricky piece of machinery. And uh, <clears throat> there are those who envy another one. I want to be like Brother So-and-so. Uh, man, as soon as he hits the pulpit, he gets on, on his high wheels and he's gone. May I ask you, is screaming the only way to preach Is running the only way to get anointed? Is that the only way to feed people is by beating a drum? <coughs> Why can't preaching be the principal part of all your program? I'm going to preach the Word of God. Amen. Now when you come to uh, the life of uh, the preacher, it's not bad for you to have a good helpmate. A good wife and she's a great asset sometimes some preachers wives or the pastor they use their preacher as a figurehead their husband is a figurehead and they are the pastor if you get to that point then you lost your manhood and your calling because it's not in God's word for uh, your wife to know the wisdom that God has qualified you to know. Amen. Although sad to say, a lot of preachers' wives are a little bit wiser than their preacher husband. That should not be. Should. Well then, you can use your wife to a point, but there should be a time when you are the last word. And say, now just a minute, I'm going to handle this. I'll handle it. It's me. I'm going to handle it. Figure it out for yourself. I know that most preachers come home to their wives. I've just got five minutes or more. I know that in the, in the dealing with it, that thing shines up there. You can't tell whether there's five or six needles up there or not. And uh, you might... Uh, 
say, well, I heard Brother Gidro say that. That's the wrong thing for you to do. Do things on your own, your own wisdom, your own concentration. But never pull the trigger too fast. There's been more mistakes and more wrecks made over not knowing the timing of the thing. The timing of it. It's a fine point. When to do something and when not to do something is a big thing in the wisdom of a preacher. Of course, when you go out as evangelist, you should observe all the successes that you see. Take note of that success. Put it all together and see which particular avenue should I take. Which impression will I carry with me through my ministry? If you're not studying a church and how it operates, you're wasting your time. As an evangelist, you're wasting some time you're going to wish you had have done it. Because just because you can jump pretty high, that'll make you maybe a pretty good evangelist. But it's going to take something else besides jumping to be a pastor. Amen. Because Amen. a lot of jumping, anybody can do it. Yeah. But when it comes to preaching the Word of God, it takes somebody that has their mind in it, their head in the trough, and need the right thing. Well, it's for you to be in spirit, in faith, and in purity. You know, if you don't have a right spirit, if uh, your Irish in you is sticking out, you're easily made mad, or another thing, you're too suspicious. Everybody you see talking to each other, you'll figure they're talking about you. Now, you may not know it, but you're not that important. <laughs> the Bible says a person that can control his spirit is greater than he that can take a city. The spirit within you, like the spirit for lusting for money. God didn't call you to be rich. I don't care how many rich preachers you see, it's wrong. We're not to make a luscious earthly living over the fact that there's some lost people out there. He gave his all for the lost. It's not wrong for you to have the money to feed your family. It's not wrong for you to have a few suits of clothes, maybe three or four or five. It, it's not wrong for you to have a good automobile and maybe a second one for your car. But Apostle Paul said, having uh, food and raiment, be contented. Yeah. Be happy over it. Yeah. We're living over it. But you see, the day we're living in right now, people resent you talking about the poor days. They, uh, they like to hear about it in an amusing way. Amuse you. But we thought nothing of it nowadays. My wife asked me this other day, she said, did you ever think that we'd have a house to live in like we have today? We, only have, we have just a small house, 1,600 feet and, uh, of living space. But we've got a house, and we thank God for it. When the wind blows and it's cold, why well, I love to get on my knees and say, God, I thank you because there's not a roof up there leaking. Because in our day, we had to move the beds when it when it rained in a parsonage. And nowadays, uh, the furniture in the parsonage was so full of bed bugs, you almost had to burn the furniture. It's facts. But now that makes you thank God for a roof. But nowadays, who thinks about thanking God for a roof? Why, you can get a roof, but you don't know how to appreciate a roof unless you have had one. Then who knows how many of you thank God because of a loaf of bread. Maybe you are gripe because, honey, didn't you get some bread today? I, you know good enough we've been out of bread for two days now, and you didn't get a yankee, 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 yank. And you've got money in your pocket surplus that you can drive up there to a little grocery store and get you a loaf of bread. But, brother, how would you like to live in a place where for two days you didn't have any bread at all? And you couldn't go and get any. 
Therefore, you see, the day you live in, you don't know how to appreciate bread. But to appreciate bread is a great thing. So you thank God for the good sheet that don't have a bunch of patches on it. And they tear at the least touch of it. You thank God for the good pillows. You thank God that you're not sleeping on a cotton pile like you used to when you was an evangelist. You thank God because you got a good modern bathroom and you don't have an outhouse out there. Because you see, maybe you've never lived any other way but what you've lived right now. You don't know how to appreciate a good bathroom. A good bathroom. And that makes us all arrogant. I deserved all this. Now somebody sat up a long time to invent a light bulb. A long time. And waited and waited and waited and waited. The man was 72 hours without sleep and just drank a cup of coffee or two and a little piece of bread. But he was so close that he wouldn't go to bed. What was it all about? Creating and making something that was never made before. The light bulb. And nowadays, you go to house, you go to the store and buy eight or ten of them, and you screw them in a the plug, and the electricity comes. You don't know how to push your light bulb. How would you like to carry a candle around the place? Did you ever? Bring a kerosene ramp and, and, and maybe leave everybody else in darkness, but you take the only light that was and go to your bedroom and then you come back with it and say, well, thank God there's light here now. Maybe only one light. No, you don't know how to appreciate it. So every dime that comes to you, every nickel that comes to you, is something you ought to pray over and say, thank God for this check. Thank God for this money. Thank God for this money. Thank God because I can pay my car note. But then if you keep on saying, God, give me a car, God, give me a car, you go buy one $225 notes and, and all you ever do is be burdened about your car note. And as soon as you pray for God to pay it off, you buy another. And then you got to start praying and all you're doing is bothering God for car notes the rest of your life. Your burden is for a car note. Because you just can't live. That big shot preacher over there won't recognize me as a successful preacher unless I drive up there with a 300 horsepower mammoth. And uh, is that the kind of a preacher you want to be? Impress them with an automobile. Impress them with a new necktie. Brother, if you're just dressed in, in, in uh, just khakis and you've got the message of Almighty God, there's going to be some human being somewhere that's going to want to hear it. They're going to want to hear what you have to say because it's from the bottom of your heart and it was dug out from your knees and you know good and well that God gave it to you. And you're going to, you, somebody's going to want you. Don't forget that. You say, well, nobody wants me unless I got a great big car. That's the wrong thing, friend. That's a wrong impression. That's false preaching. And what if you don't have it? You still have a message for somebody somewhere. Well, the Bible said John the Baptist was clothed with camel's hair. And he ate locusts and he ate wild honey. Suppose your dinner today would be locusts and wild honey. And you'd tell the cooks and say, is this all you got? Well, that's what John the Baptist ate every day. Well, I'm not John the Baptist. Because I can go over there and get me a hamburger right quick. That's true. But why did the Bible let you know that that man lived that way? Because that man lived for God and was not dependent on anybody. And he was preaching his gospel by living on the natural things of the world. The honey come from the trees and the locusts was everywhere. And that's what he had. He, he wasn't trying to pay a house note or a, a car note or buy his 11th suit. No, nah, it didn't make no difference. Why did it say that about him? Because God wanted that impression to be made on you. That money doesn't rule you. Don't worry about money. Worry about preaching. Worry about a soul. How can I key in 
on the, on the mentality and the mind of a human being not to be impressed with me. But I do have a good argument. I've got a genuine faith in that argument. I've got a constructive doctrine. I've got to give my mind to that. I've got to have a good word, a good conversation. I have to have good impression. When I have a good impression, I can turn a, a, a heart around. I believe I can. But if you only wait to tell sob stories to save people, it, 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 you, they'll have to be fed sob stories the rest of their life. How grandma died and how oh, grandpa went to the well and brought the cold water and all that sob stuff, you know. You don't find it in this book. You know that if you want to fill in between, you would fill in millions of hours of torment and a modern day composer or a writer could write you up a story by using some personality, some fictitious idea. But the fiction wouldn't be far from fact because there's a whole lot unwritten here that was lived there. And that living touched God. Now, <clears throat> Let me phase this out. As you read the Word of God, you'll come up on some, some exciting stories. And, of course, David and Goliath and how he whipped the giant is always a good favorite. And Miriam as she beat the tamarind, that's a wonderful thing. And uh, the day of Pentecost and everybody uh, doing what they did, you know, and... Uh, we are Pentecostal-minded folks, and we think, well, that's the berries. Well, but then could you think about that uh, Paul and Silas got into a jail after being whipped and flogged? And I, I wish I could say that when Apostle Paul said, I bear in my body the marks of Lord Jesus Christ. That's the greatest credentials in the world. But there's nobody want to beat you up nowadays. Uh, they're not afraid of us. Pentecostal folks have, they got to be, they, they're anemic enough to where Baptist folks are not afraid, Methodist folks are not afraid. In my day, they was afraid we are going to take everybody. But, and that's one reason why they persecuted us. But uh, when they went down there, uh, why did God ever permit that jail to be shaken? Now, don't forget it. Preaching it is one thing. But having it to happen to you and not even knowing it was going to happen to you. You could, you'd have a text the rest of your life. And everywhere Paul would say, well, uh, I want to tell everybody here, when I was in Ephesus, I was uh, put in a jailhouse. And bless God, hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord, glory, glory to God, praise God, amen, hallelujah. We went way down there in the bottom cell, praise God, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen, praise God, amen, hallelujah. And, uh. When we was uh, at 12 o'clock, uh, praise God, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, hallelujah, amen, uh, amen, uh, uh, we decided we was going we to sing, uh, praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah, hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, amen, while well, we got to singing, and uh, praise God, hallelujah, amen, praise the Lord, amen, praise God, amen, hallelujah, we sang, praise God, amen, hallelujah, and then we prayed, praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise the Lord, and all at once you start uh, jumping about six feet in the air and say, Oh, that once while that day I'll begin to shake. Praise God, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen, praise God, hallelujah, amen. Praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah. Amen, glory to God. Oh, then your wife that night says, Brother, uh, honey, you sure were anointed to preach tonight. Yeah. All right. Now, if you call that anointing. Now, later on, after this particular group, group sang in the... Uh, they said the power fell down. I was talking to two or three members of the general board and some others still sitting there. They were wondering about that, you know, talking about it. So I looked at Brother Greer and I said, well, wait a minute, Brother Greer. And the others. I said, God is very particular nowadays. What's that? I said, well, you've got to sing to him a certain way. You got to practice a long time how to handle that guitar. And you got to practice a long time how to squeeze that accordion. And you better know your P's and Q's about them notes and how to how to act and how to come on with it. And after a while you it, it all you know, God's particular about that. 
and he won't fall down when it's uh, fellas like, you know, just get up there and just preach the solid word of God. God just won't bring his power down. Uh, he just particular about things like that. And then I said, if you, he was interested in those other people. Those three people got up there and sang, and the Lord loved their singing. And the Lord brought down his body. I said, now listen, Kid Rose, you know good and well you're just a pull now leg about that thing. I said, well, isn't that the way it looks? I said, you may be, it may be sad to admit it, and you may not want to admit it, but that's the impression that the modern day people have. They've got to be lifted up from their seat in excitement. Don't have to be the word of God, just so they get that, that certain rhythm going by that's the berries now. And so a lot of preachers get that impression. And they get in that mold. And that's a mold they get into. And it's a praise the Lord, amen, hallelujah, praise God, amen, hallelujah. And I hope tonight they shout enough. I don't have to preach. And we can brag about it the next day. Man, we didn't have to preach. A sad old day. Amen. Was it God's will for you not to preach? Was it a bunch of kids having a good time? Was it that way? Personally, I might say it to you. I would go a long way to have somebody shake me with that Bible. And move me. Let me throb. Because right now, you may not believe this at all. Because it's a little negative. Maybe you don't believe it enough at all. But you've got so many segments of the world's doubting a lot of things people do. And you've got the charismatic group that's coming up here. And with their speaking in tongues, they're taking away one of the candlesticks we've had for years. Claim that they're speaking in tongues. And, of course, they go ahead and they're in the Baptists. They're in the Presbyterians. That they're in the symbols of God. And they're Catholics. And they carry those people away. And some of our Pentecostal folks are, well, that's just as good as the UPC people. They speak in tongues like they do, too. And that's the end of it. They just so you speak in tongues. Now, the same argument holds good to the other part of it. The Word of God, the reason why people glorify God and shout is because something happened to them. The Apostle Paul did nothing down there. Him and Silas, they did nothing but preach the Word of God. They didn't shake that jail. And they didn't ask God to shake the jail. They didn't have any instrument to get God to shake the jail. They had to bring a trio up there to, uh, 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 say, uh, for the power of God. Now we got that power of God. And here we go. We're going to get the power of God. And, uh, and the first thing you know, we're going to get out of this jail. You mean with that thing, that thing of squeezing here is going to move God? Yeah, watch us. Watch us. When we put ourselves together, we start going up and down. You're going to see some power. And all you've got over there is a bunch of jailers. Think about that. And those jailers are going to like that too? I don't know. But boy, it worked where we come from. And when you're through, the jailhouse is still locked and the building is still there. And you're going home, your head tucked. You didn't have the power of God. They, yours was artificial. But those men sang by themselves. And they prayed by themselves. They weren't sorry. They didn't feel sorry. They wasn't asking for the jailhouse to come to pieces. They just sang and praised God. That's all they did. The power fell and shook the jail. What made the power fall and shake the jail? It was a genuineness of their attitude toward God. God has his heavens loaded, loaded with power that's superpower. To drive away sickness, diseases, troubles, and problems. And settle uh, the, many of the problems of the world today. But you're not going to make God jump just because uh, you can sing good. Now... Uh, I think that ought to be about 15 minutes singing to an hour and a half preaching. That's, good. Uh, that's, that's the best way it is. And maybe they don't sing at all. Because I believe the early church, the most of what they did, they preached. They disposed of the things that they had to say about God. Now, we got to be instruments of the Lord. I want to be. Now, the man sitting next to you may have a different idea that you've got. And, and vice versa, all the way down the line. Some of you are going to hit the trail after a while. And uh, you say, well, I've already uh, tried this, uh, 
this, and we're working to find, all right, the stamp is on you. The brand is on you. Do it as you will. Be a good Bible student. Get a, a thorough understanding of the Word of God. Preach the facts of the life of people as you know people. You must not only know the Word of God, but you have to know the, the thing that the Word of God is applied to, and that's people. You have to know them. You know their reaction. What makes them mad? What makes them glad? What makes them happy? What makes them sad? What makes them sorry? What makes them want to destroy? What, what, what makes them not love? What makes them hate? What makes them lust? What makes them desire the affairs of this life? You have to know all of that, and that's your battlefield. It's a human life. Now, these things that I'm saying right now may not affect you today or tomorrow. But someday along the fields of battle, maybe you can remember it. Amen, amen, amen.